Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to CIBC Presents Entrepreneurship 101. Uh, tonight's lecture, Nuts and Bolts, Creating a Company. Um, you, those of you who were here for the startup review of all the lectures and um, uh, who have gone to the website, you'll see the lectures are generally all about your company and your customers. And we emphasize marketing, determining your market, hiring people, developing your product. We realized a couple of years ago, actually, we need to step back and give you a primer on how to start a company and who are you going to have to talk with just to get a company going. So that's what we're going to try and cover tonight. Okay. And I am, again, delighted to, well, we have my colleague, Jen White from SIG. Uh, is back to, uh, to uh, um, help us out with the social entrepreneur side. And I am delighted that uh, tonight we have Dan Bolger from CIBC. Dan is a business banking advisor at the GTA North. And as someone who deals a lot with uh, small and high-tech companies, I think um, he brings a perspective from a different community of what companies really need to do to get themselves embedded in their, uh, in their ecosystem. So welcome, Dan. Thank you. And we're going to put him on the spot uh, from time to time as we, uh, as we go through the, uh, the lectures, uh, the lecture uh, here. So um, without further ado, let's, uh, oh. We forgot. For any of those who are interested in tweeting this evening, and we hope that you all do, we have a hashtag now. It's ENT101. And we encourage you to, um, whenever you tweet, find something interesting that you use that hashtag. And then, of course, if you go back and um, you're interested in just following the lectures, um, you can obviously use that as well to follow the dialogue. Good. And I forgot to mention, Dan, I think about the same time I was in chemistry, Dan was a uh, molecular uh, biochemist, uh, molecular biologist, so he has some pretty good background credentials. <laughs> now, so. No questions on DNA tonight, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so I'm going to control the clicker. Um, and, oops. Okay, that's us. Um, do you want to talk about this? Sure. So when you're thinking about starting an enterprise initially, sometimes you think of it very simplistically. It's just yourself. It's your potentially your suppliers um, or your customers. But in fact, you have to think of a larger global perspective. And I'm not thinking global as in you know, all around the world per se, but think of a larger ecosystem, which in fact you have to integrate yourself into. So for example, you have, your, like I said, your customers, you have your suppliers, but you have the government. You also have investors, you have trade associations, you have regulatory bodies. And so the crux of this, um, you know, this presentation this evening is to introduce you into the entire ecosystem that you will in fact have to navigate when you start your organization. So typically, this is what we're focused on for starting a business. You know, there's you, Inc., and you're trying to get a product or a service, something out to a customer group. And you have suppliers. And as I was saying, basically, that's what we tend to focus on, okay? It's not that simple. And I will warn you, there is some bad news in this, uh, in this, in this Why lecture. Why are you looking at me when you say there's bad news? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, I'll look at, I'll look at oh, you. Oh, thanks. Oh, uh, yeah, look at you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so what should be um, your first step? So once you've figured out your idea, you've looked at your, the market, and you're really jazzed about your idea, and you kind of have to dig really deep and say, how do I incorporate? So in fact, on this list right now for for-profit and non-profit corporations, when you go to the presentation online as of tomorrow or the next day, you can actually click on, the, click on these underlined um, points. So the Canada Business website, or the Business Corporations Act for nonprofits. You can go to the Nonprofit and Corporations Handbook. And each of these will actually detail a series of steps that you need to take in order to incorporate, whether you are a nonprofit or a for profit enterprise. And I'll be to totally honest, it's not a lot of fun. There's lots of paperwork, there's lots of things to check off, things to do. There are a few checks that need to be mailed, all of it which are nominal fees. But there is definitely a process that you need to follow in order to incorporate your business and or a nonprofit. Um. I'll let you continue with these, <laughs> you're on thing. a roll. 
Um, I really want to, for those of you who are interested in the nonprofit space, um, the CRA website actually has some detailed information that's really specific to you. So in Canada, you can, uh, you can incorporate as either a nonprofit entity or a charity. And it's not really up to you per se. You can have an idea of what you want to do, your vision, your organization. But in fact, they will ultimately make the decision. So I would encourage you to go to this website and actually read up on this and the process that CRA undertakes that when they actually make the decision to say, yes, in fact, you are a nonprofit, or in fact, we're going to enable you to be a charity, which then allows you to issue receipts that individuals can then use on their, for their tax um, deductions. And I will say, um, in terms of incorporating in federally versus in Ontario, um, I've never really understood the distinction. There are some subtle distinctions about the uh, percentage, I think, of Canadians that you have to have on your board of directors, which can become significant if you bring on a US investor um, or a, a private uh, um, uh, um, independent board advisor uh, or an independent board member who happens to be from the States. Um, so, they're subtle, but they're, um, they may be non-trivial. And Dan, I don't know if you... Well, uh, there's, if you incorporate in a different province, uh, as opposed to, let's say, having a, a Canadian registration, uh, you will be subject to that province's uh, tax laws. Going back a few years ago, I know that I, I used to deal with... Uh, companies that were primarily holding companies that would incorporate specifically in Alberta because Alberta tax is lower than it is, let's say, in Ontario or Quebec or uh, elsewhere. Um, I'm, I, I am not uh, up to date on the various tax laws uh, in Canada right now, but uh, if it is something that you think going down the road is going to be a situation for you that you would be concerned about your tax liabilities. You could uh, certainly talk to your accountants and or lawyers about uh, incorporating in a different province. Yeah, I, I, now the interesting counterbalance to that lower tax, um, you see, that's relevant to companies that are making lots of money, Dan deals with. Um, <laughs> well, not all of them, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> um, but Mars runs a number of programs, um, for, for example, the Investment Accelerator Fund, which can invest in a company. It can only invest in Ontario-based companies, and at least 50% of the employees have to be here because it's government money. And you better believe if there's a provincial government program that is basically funding economic development activities, you will be required to uh, spend the bulk of your money and to be registered in that province. That's relevant. So it's an interesting balance because when you're starving and trying to get started, you want to be where you, know, where you can get access yeah. to that money. When you're rich and making tons of money, that $500,000 that you got is largely irrelevant saving a few million bucks in tax every year now becomes important. So it's a bit of a, you know, um, it's a bit of a, a, a tough decision. Where do you incorporate? Um, so I just throw those out as, uh, as factors to balance. Just, I, I'm just curious in the audience, how many people in here would register a not-for-profit organization? So we got a, a few of you. So the tax situation there is irrelevant. Yeah. Uh, so you don't have to, to worry about it. it not, just another aside, sorry, it, I don't mean to cut in on your, uh, your talk, but uh, if you're registering a not-for-profit organization, uh, the, the intention is not that you will continuously generate losses. Uh, when you hear the term, well, not for profit, meaning you'll never generate a profit. Well, there's a difference between generating losses and generating surpluses. If it's a not for profit organization, you're still wanting to generate surpluses because if you're going to be in the hole every year, you're not going to be around for, for a long time. So uh, just remember if it's not for profit, it still should be showing surpluses. 
or at least break even on a yearly mm -hmm. basis. Um, there's often questions about incorporating in the states. Um, frequent uh, pathway is to create a Delaware corporation and there are tax reasons for doing that. One of the reasons for doing that is that U.S.-based investors will want to be, uh, invest in a U.S. corporation because they then get taxed very favorably compared to Canadian investors. So they will not simply invest in a Canadian corporation. Um, that is, so you often, you can create what's called a butterfly structure with a Canadian corporation and a U.S. corporation and, you know, exchange share ownership. It is complicated. It is very expensive in legal fees. And that is one of those things I would suggest, don't try this at home alone. Okay, uh, when you get to the stage to need to do that, um, you will likely have uh, some pretty good lawyers working with you. So maybe you want Jen to talk about the mm -hmm. nonprofit side. So if, um, I was talking to my director actually earlier today and I was asking her why in fact a nonprofit organization would be interested in moving into the States. Um, and what she has done, because she's actually had an organization that was based both in Canada and in the US, and she primarily advocated a partnership route. So instead of, you have two options. You can either, if you start something here and it happens to go really, really well, you have a donor base that's fantastic, your services that you're providing are, are being received very well, you can in fact partner with an organization in the US that is providing something very similar. But in fact, if you're interested in moving into the US market, for similar reasons that Tony discussed actually for for-profit organizations, investors in the US and or um, individuals interested in giving donations like to give to US organizations. So there are three links I've put on this, this slide for you. So one is GuideStar. GuideStar is a nonprofit organization that seeks to provide a lot of transparency for the nonprofit sector. So if you're an organization in the US and you want to get out as much information to your donors, because there are a lot of donors who are interested in how you're spending your money, who you're in fact involving in your um, services, all that information they can find on GuideStar. GuideStar also acts as a great resource with lots of information for any of you interested in doing this. Um, the other thing about the US versus Canada is that there are a lot of tax different. There are tax, different tax implications. So in the US, we call the organizations the 5013C, which are different than the charity and the nonprofit structures here in Canada. So again, go to the IRS site. You can find a lot of um, information that'll, that'll enable you to understand how, in fact, there's distinctions between the, the two different uh, the structures. And finally, I want to bring up something that is um, increasingly becoming really interesting for US-based nonprofits. It's called the L3C legal structure, which is the low profit limited liability. It comes after the, L, um, the LLC organization. And essentially, it enables individuals to make investments into these companies. So foundations often are looking and saying, I would rather give not just a grant, but I want to give an organization a small debt or equity position. And I would expect a 2 or 3% return, a very nominal return. So that's something that's actually becoming very, very attractive for individuals in the nonprofit sector saying, I want to make money, or I want to do something great for my social enterprise, but I also want to attract some investment dollars. In Canada right now, we don't have any such structures. The Mars Group, and SIG particularly, are looking into exploring options like this for the Canadian infrastructure. Um, in a few weeks, we'll actually be releasing a white paper that discusses the different options here in Canada and also vis-a-vis -vis the US and the UK. So I certainly, um, if you're interested in further pursuing that, something that you can definitely check into and that we're eagerly um, pushing forward. OK. Now, I said there would be some bad news. The tax man cometh. Um, you will spend, um, or you might have to spend an inordinate amount of time filling in tax forms. You will be required to pay federal tax. You will pay uh, provincial tax. You will pay GST, PST on the goods or services you provide. Uh, you can't escape it. Um, and uh, I actually meant to make a comment when Dan was talking about the, the not-for-profits and tax not being relevant. Um, remember, most of you who are incorporating as a for-profit, there will be a significant number of not-for-profits. Um, it's not intentional, but that happens. And that obviously has a bearing on um, how much you worry about taxes that you pay. Um, a word of advice. Um, I didn't know this when I uh, started out uh, in business. 
And I actually tried to read the federal corporate tax the act. You um, don't have a life, is that what you're saying? That, well, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, I have my pocket protector, uh, chemist and all that. Yeah. Um, let me tell you, I once upon a time thought I understood quantum mechanics. <laughs> that is simple compared to the Federal <laughs> Tax Act. Um, and uh, I think that, that leads to our uh, next comment. And you know, we, can, we can read this. The incorporation process can be complex. This is from the Canada Business website, which is already about, I think that's about a 10 megabyte download. And that's the simplified guide mm -hmm. to incorporation and taxes. Um, and, and the advice here is get an accountant, and Dan has already, I think, mentioned this. Get an accountant or a lawyer to help you. I went to my accountant and I said, if, if I sent someone to you, just basic incorporation, get things, and he said, yeah, 800 to 1500 bucks, and that gets you your tax numbers and everything registered with the government, and, um, it's, it's, the, it's money well invested. And so I think that leads us to our next slide. You know, your ecosystem has just expanded. You're now docking with the federal and provincial government for taxes. Uh, you now have a link to a lawyer and an accountant. Um, and so um, this is the first part of your, the expansion of your ecosystem. And I, you know, it sounds like a pain. Yeah, yeah, I gotta fill in forms with the government. But again, Dan, as as a as a as a banker advising clients, um, what's oh, your comments? Yeah, I, I, the, um, I, I've been in the bank for a few years. You can sort of see that there's some gray hair and wrinkles there. That the, one of the things that I, I consistently come across is people who don't want to spend any money on advisors lawyers and accountants and, and uh, environmental engineers, engineers, architects, whatever. Um, it's, uh, it, it's false economy. Um, the other thing is that uh, we'll say, oh, well, some accountants will charge me $100 an hour where others will charge me $400 an hour. I'll just go with a guy that or the lady that charges me $100 an hour. Well, you get what you pay for. Um, there are uh, chartered accountants out there. There are CGAs out there. There are CMAs out there. There are bookkeeping services out there. And if you go with just the, the lowest common denominator, you're not going to get the advice that you need, and you're not going to get maybe the statements. For instance, uh, an accountant will produce at the end of the year for you financial statements that if you need to go to a banker, those financial statements uh, have to be accepted by the banker. Uh, we rely on those, those documents very, very heavily. If you had it done by rinky-dinky uh, bookkeeping service, uh, we may say it's meaningless to us. If you went to one of the larger CA firms, out there, yes, we would trust it more. So again, false economy to go to the lowest common denominator. Don't pay for the cheapest CAs. Don't pay for the cheapest lawyers. And uh, spend that money up front right when you get going. Sorry, go ahead. No, no I think that's, uh, that's excellent advice. And you know, in the building, Ogilvy Renault have an office here, All right. full spectrum law firm. Um, and we actually have some graduates of, of E101 um, that have, they're now actually located in the building. One individual is a CA and uh, has moved from uh, one of the major tech transfer offices where he worked on spinouts and has basically now hung out a shingle on his own. And he will help startups because he's very familiar with startups. He will help uh, start up with um, accounting, uh, with governance, you know, um, minutes of board meetings, and all those sorts of services. He's um, right here in the building? He's right yeah. here in the building. Oh, that's good. 
Uh, and I'm not going to give names out now, uh, since I shouldn't be giving uh, advertisements except Ogilvy, because they're the core sponsor. Uh, and they paid the you to juice. say this yes, tonight. Yes, yes. Well, <laughs> it comes with the territory. <laughs> Wait, to, you don't know what I say about CV, CIBC on, on other lectures. Yeah. Um, and, and last year, there was a group, um, three scientists from quite diverse disciplines who had switched and gone into law. And they all graduated at the same time. And they're based here now. So they have science, diverse science backgrounds, PhDs, but they're now lawyers. And they are looking to work with real high-tech, some in life sciences, some uh, IT companies in providing um, early stage, uh, you know, some early legal advice. Now, they don't have the brand name reputation of uh, Tories or anything like that, but in your real early stages, um, they're very sympathetic to research and innovation because they've lived it. So that's a, you know, that's a, another t uh, track to follow. The big firms, uh, they, they are not necessarily the most expensive. There are some firms out there that have a, they have a startup company package for a fixed rate. They'll offer you, you know, per year, they'll offer you the following services. And that's based on reasonable assumption of time for maybe shareholder agreements and things like that. You can always negotiate, or at least attempt to. They won't uh, negotiate, we'll try someone else. So there's a variety of different options, um, but to but, uh, echo Dan's comment, don't, um, don't go cheap on this. Um, as they say, uh, a person who acts uh, as their own lawyer has a fool for a client. Um, this is true in this case. And you will save money big time uh, if you get professional help. They do it all the time. They know what box to check off. I can't tell you how many times you look at it and say, I don't know which I am of these two. I don't even know what they're talking about. Someone who knows it says, no, you're the right-hand box. Don't bother. You're there and move on. Can I just throw in something really quick there? Sure. <laughs> just to throw in some side for the nonprofits. Obviously, when you're um, incorporating as a nonprofit, you're, you're strictly looking at how much money you have and from a donor perspective. Um, and sometimes you don't have the same kind of revenue upswing that a, um, a technology company may, in fact, experience the six months to a year if, if they're really lucky. So I'm actually, I work with a few clients right now that I've taken to some partners down at Ogilvy Renault, and they've been absolutely fantastic. And so while um, lawyers are particularly sympathetic to startup companies, they're also very sympathetic to nonprofit organizations because they know that um, clearly your um, you know, profit and loss, per se, is not nearly as lucrative, and you have to kind of manage your finances very, very strictly. Um, so again, I would obviously echo the same com um, comments, but also know that you can find a good number of, of nonprofit lawyers in the space that are eager to work with you um, and certainly ready to do so at a um, pro bono, uh, either or a reduced, a fairly reduced rate. Yeah. Actually, I would echo that. I, um, I, I'm involved with a small charity, and I, um, I asked my accountant to do their um, uh, returns for them. And uh, he said, yeah, fine, he's doing it pro bono. I'm not sure it's not buried in my bills somewhere. But um, <laughs> they say they're doing it for free. And, and most firms do have a budget of time to, to, to help out not-for-profits and that. Mm -hmm. um, OK. Um, so you're incorporated. You're going to need a shareholder's agreement. Remember that lawyer? Now you're going to need, uh, you're, going, you're seriously going to need uh, a lawyer here. Shareholders agreement can be one page, it can be a hundred pages, but you need to clearly understand between you and your partners and investors, if there are some, who, you know, what's the ownership split? That's an obvious one. Um, who gets to make what decisions? Uh, you know, there's two of you, and you disagree. You're at a stalemate. How do you resolve something like that? Um, what are the responsibilities of the different players? Um, you know, if somebody is contributing intellectual property, is it assigned? Is it licensed in? Um, there's all sorts of other issues. A shareholders agreement is simply 
the rules of the game. And you set those rules. Now, there are pretty standard ones. And one of the reasons that shareholders' agreements can um, reach 100 page, pages is that, that every clause in there reflects really one really ugly situation. And the lawyers now insert that clause to prevent that from ever happening again. Well, since there's an unlimited number of ugly situations that can arise, the list of those clauses goes on and on and on. But trust me, they're all in there for a reason. Um, and they're in there because somebody got burned for not having that covered off. And, and Jen, I don't know what, uh, what you'd add for uh, I don't, not-for-profits. Don't, yeah, not-for-profits. We don't have shareholder agreements per se, but we have something that's called your mission statement, your value statement. So as you seek to expand your nonprofit, and I would even say this for for-profit social purpose businesses, you're less concerned necessarily with the sweat equity decisions or what your partnership will look like, but you're concerned with, am I asking the right questions of the individual that I want to involve with my mission? Do they share the same values? Do they look at the same social problem in the very same way that I do? Or do they have a particular nuance? And when I'm sitting there, and I, you know, as the, meaning you, as you're sitting there as the executive director or the founder of this idea, can I rely on this person to go out and to promulgate and to enforce the ideas that, in fact, we have around this social problem and how we're going to approach it. And that's really, really key because, as you all know, whether you're here for the technology side, you're here for the nonprofit, or you're here for for profit social, whatever, we all know that there's a plethora of social problems out there, and everybody has their own particular way of approaching it. And so, as a nonprofit um, person, you need to really understand that your vision is, is directly aligned with any partner that, in fact, you seek to engage with. And you know, if, I remember you mentioned in, in uh, previous lecture, mission creep. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got two partners and one who is more concerned about the, uh, you know, the, the social uh, objective and the other one who says, you know, we're not making money, we really need to focus more on making more money out of these. If you haven't got a mechanism in place to resolve these, um, those can be those can tear an organization apart. And you've all heard, of, you know, family businesses. Dan, you've probably oh, seen. Oh, I've seen so many ugly scenarios. Um, as I'm not going to go through any of the stories, but it, it really, it, a shareholders agreement, partnership agreement, it is not very much unlike a, a prenuptial agreement. Um, a lot of people don't like when they're getting married. Don't like to even address the issue of a, pre, a prenup. We love one another. Why should we get a prenup? <laughs> never going to divorce. We'll never separate. We're going to have, it's going to be forever after. We're going to live in ecstasy. Well, the reality is that marriages do break up. And so do partnerships and, uh, and, and partners, uh, shareholders within companies. Um, get all the dirty laundry out right at the beginning. I, I mean, you can, you, you can figure out what your differences of opinion are pretty early in a relationship with your business partners. So put that in the agreement right away. It'll save a lot of, uh, a lot of heartache down the road. One of, one of the uh, more common ones that I see are shotgun. Anybody ever heard of a shotgun clause? The shotgun clause is, uh, it doesn't mean like you're going to take a shotgun to your partner, but it, I mean, it could uh, it's down the road if you really get to hate each other that much. But shotgun clause is basically saying, okay, the partners have had differences. It, it means that one partner can initiate the buyout of another partner using the shotgun clause as the basis uh, for that. So if the one partner reacts to that shotgun, by saying, okay, well, I'm going to up your ante, blah, 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 then they get into their negotiations and so on. But if there's no shotgun clause within that agreement, these people could be fighting at each other for years. And it's not just the individuals that are now involved. It is the families. It is the spouses. It is the children. It is anybody else who, who might be um, close to these people. So the partnership agreement, the shareholders agreement, is an important document to sort of preclude some of those problems that may occur down the road. Yeah. And a shotgun clause is, like its namesake, um, 
a fairly blunt but very effective instrument. Basically, 50-50 partners, I offer to buy you out at, uh, for a million bucks. If you accept, I have to pay that. If you don't accept, you have to buy me out at a million bucks. Pure and simple. It's one or t'other. Now, as Dan said, it can trigger a negotiation process, but if no one wants to negotiate, it's very simple. Yeah, I set a price. If you think it's too low and you don't take it, well, therefore, you should take me out because you're getting a bargain by your own definition. So these things have been created. They fix problems really quickly. They're pretty blunt tools, but they, they allow the business to go on as opposed to dying because of a lack of agreement. Um, so, um, okay, do you want to tackle sure. this one? So are you going to have employees? I would assume the obvious answer would be yes. Again, regardless of if you're a nonprofit or you're a for-profit company, um, you are going to need help to execute on your mission or your strategy. Um, and with, of course, um, any kind of employees, in fact, you have payroll taxes to, in fact, make sure that you collect on so you can pay the tax man, which we talked about a little bit earlier. You also need to be um, sure that you register with the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board, the WSIB. And again, that's underlined because there's a link to that on the, uh, the PowerPoint slide, which will take you into a site which, again, details um, very clearly why you need to do this, what you'll be charged, how much you need to take out um, on a bi-weekly or monthly basis, depending on how often you pay your employees. Um, traditionally, it's bi-weekly. Um, and where the money actually goes. But this is really, really important um, because often employees rely on you to just make sure they take care, that you take care of the taxes and they don't have to necessarily worry about it until they, and they file their, their annual uh, tax return. And I, what I would add to that, um, the government treats um, uh, your, your, tax rem your employee tax remittances very, very seriously. You remit them, but it's not your money. It's your employee's money that you are remitting on their behalf. That is one of the few things that directors of a company can be held personally liable for. The government doesn't mess around. It's their money, and, uh, and it's your employee's money until the government gets its hands on it. And uh, there's no, they're not going to let you sit on that and, you know, because you're, you're tight for cash and uh, pay those remittances later. Um, that's one thing they're pretty unforgiving about. Them. Yeah, oh yeah, no, it's, uh, the, the government will, it's, it's what we d call, uh, has super priority payables. The government is, ranks on top of everybody. So you as an employer, if you are not taking care of those remittances, uh, the government will go after you, period, plain and simple. It's just a matter of time. It's not a matter of if. Um, having said that, uh, we were talking about lawyers and accountants uh, being your partners in the business. There are companies out there that will look after that for you. Now, if you are just beginning, you have one or two employees, uh, it might not be that difficult for you to go in and, and fill out the forms and so on. But uh, if you don't have the time and you're getting more and more employees that you have to look after, uh, you can delegate that to companies that uh, offer these services. Uh, ADP is, is one company, Ceridian is another one. Uh, they will do that. It's fairly inexpensive service. So they, they will do not only the, the payroll, they'll you know they'll cut the checks, and uh, uh, but they, they can also do uh, the, the taxes. Uh, and do the, the tax forms at the end of the year as well. So um, if it's something that you want to, you, you have more, you want to devote your time more to your business than to the sundry administrivia of, of payroll, taxes, and so on, you can get one of these companies involved. Yeah, that's actually, again, excellent advice because by now most people are thinking, you know, this is what government choking innovation because you're filling in your, your monthly payroll, you're filling in your workers' comp, your workplace safety uh, board, uh, you're filling in your federal taxes and your provincial taxes, it's forms and forms and forms. Government has actually recognized that over the last little while. 
if you behave yourself, you'll start off maybe doing monthly filings. If you do them all on time, and this is very hard, but you just need to set, if you're doing it yourself, you just need to set a little bit of time aside, or if you've got a professional doing it, you know it's filed on time. You do that for a year, you'll get a nice letter that says, you're small, you can do this annually. Uh, okay, you have to prove yourself first. So it's, they have recognized that if you've demonstrated that you can be trusted, they'll take a lot of this off you. And frankly, again, if you're small, it's not a lot of money to them. They can afford to uh, relax on that. You're big enough, trust me, they, they want that money monthly. Um, but you know, it's worth investing a little bit to get on side, and then the bureaucratic load drops substantially, and that's changed in the past decade. It's a great step in the right direction, so just keep that in mind when you're uh, you know, trying to follow these, uh, fill in these forms. Um, so now, uh, now you're dealing with workers' comp, um, and uh, yeah, there's more. Um, and Jen, do you want to tackle this one? Sure. So after you've gone through the much better process, which is pre this, has figured out the name of your enterprise. Again, I'm agnostic, whether you're a for-profit or a non-profit, which is the fun part, the design aspect of it. You can go to the Canadian business website to just make sure that you, in fact, haven't named yourself like someone else. Um, which could obviously cause plenty of, of challenges. Um, actually, it's funny, last week someone came up to me and said, I've got my company named you know, xyz.ca, but in London, England, someone's called xyz.co.uk. What can I do? I said, not much of anything, actually, because we're in two entirely different jurisdictions. What he needs to focus on is just making sure that his value proposition is very clear here in Canada. I wouldn't have said that to him if he said, I, in fact, have the same name as com another company. If they have already registered that name, and you're kind of out of luck, so to speak. Um, so just check that as you're going through your design process. Um, the next thing is about trademarks and patents. And Tony, I'm going to leave this to you, because this is okay. definitely your world. Uh, and again, mine. there's a link here to CEPO, Canadian Intellectual Property Office. They have some excellent, um, uh, basically, workbooks on the whole patenting and trademarking process. Um, they're all downloadable PDFs. Uh, they've really got some quite understandable uh, material. Obviously, if you're thinking of draft, of, of you know, filing a patent, you're gonna want a patent agent to help you. But to get basic understanding of the patent process, some of the timelines and that, basic rules of the game, they have excellent uh, material. So uh, we, we do have a lecture on patenting, on patents and intellectual property, but it focuses on using them as a business tool, not the mechanics. Again, the mechanics you can get, uh, so we try to go to the value add, how to use those as a tool. Now, from a bank's perspective, I mean, you know, what's the value of a patent as an asset? Um, it's, that's, it's an interesting uh, question. When we look at, um, for instance, uh, there are a number of clients in the past have developed uh, their own proprietary software, uh, which is copyrighted. Uh, and they will show that as an asset on their balance sheets. Uh, usually it, it, it will show us, it, it could be in, in the, the long-term assets or, or the uh, fixed asset section. If, when the company is liquidated, would that asset bring back anything into the coffers to repay, let's say, the debts of that company? If at the end of the day, no, then we will look at that and give it no value at all. We will just uh, basically dis discount it completely. However, there are certain other uh, Classes of assets, I'll just say that goodwill. Uh, for instance, if you're taking a look at um, a, a dental practice, uh, I know there are no patents or copyrights with a dentist, but a dental practice has intrinsic value. Uh, so if a new dentist, new, newly graduated dentist, buys a practice from 
uh, a retiring dentist. The new dentist's balance sheet will record goodwill. And we as, as uh, bankers will look at that and say, yes, it does have goodwill. Uh, it does have more than just uh, face value or, or, or it just uh, it's an entry on a balance sheet because that dentist could turn around and sell it down the road. So um, for the most part, we'll look at goodwill, copyrights, licenses, and patents, uh, say it has no intrinsic value if the company is liquidated. But there are some exceptions to the rule. A bottler for Coca-Cola, for instance, has bought the license to bottle Coke. Uh, that's worth something. And if that bottler wants to sell their business, uh, we would look at that as having intrinsic value. And that, I think, ties into what we talked about before about debt versus equity. Um, and you know, what can you put forward as security against that debt? And you know, as a startup, a patent that's been you filed hasn't issued. Yeah, you know, uh, some folks will tell you a patent doesn't actually have any value until it's been challenged and defended successfully. That's a bit aggressive, but mm -hmm. a patent that you filed hoping it will be approved really doesn't have any uh, much value to it. Despite the fact that you think you're gonna build your business on this, um, you really can't use that as, a, expect to use that as an asset uh, that you can borrow money against. Better to take equity because someone else is saying they too believe that this will achieve value. Um, so, um, I'll tackle this one, uh, shreds, um, scientific research and experimental development tax credits. Um, a, a, a huge advantage for Canadian companies um, who are spending money on research and development. Um, it's basically a tax credit. Uh, you get money back. Uh, it's not a credit that is applied against future profits. There are some credits like that, but if you don't survive to the point where you're making profits, credits like that are frankly not very useful. What you need is cash to keep you going. And this once a year, if you are a Canadian-controlled private corporation, a CCPC, you get 35% of all of your eligible expenditures back as a check, real cash that you can put back into your company. Um, it's, uh, I won't go into details. There are eligible and ineligible expenditures. Uh, marketing and things like that are not eligible. It has to be real science, um, research, uh, and you know, development products and services. Um, uh, it's docking with good old CRA again, Canadian Revenue Agency, separate group. Um, they will do a scientific audi audit. Uh, and I, I went through one of these, and in the early days, uh, they kind of had accountants telling you whether or not you were doing science. They've gotten better. Um, they now have very experienced, uh, technically savvy people who will come around and if all you're doing is, is basically routine analyses, they'll say, that's not research, that's not development, that's just routine stuff, not eligible. So keep records. If you're a scientist or an engineer, you know how to uh, track your, your research. Do that. Write up a project definition, what your goals are. Even, you know, put it on paper. Even if you say, I'm t talking to myself, I know what my goals are, write it down. Then you have a paper trail, right? Government loves paper trails that says, I set out to do this, and each month you just write a couple of pages, we learn this, we learn that. That to the government, that's science. Um, it's, it's, it's not bad. They will also do a financial audit. Again, this is where your accountant comes in handy. 
you have tracts, you, have, you don't have a shoebox saying, well, let's see, I paid this for that lab equipment, um, and I paid these guys as scientists. You have it neatly tracked. Um, they're pretty tough the first time. You know, they're a little more relaxed after you've proven the, yourselves uh, to them. And um, you get, you know, if early stage, the bulk of your expenses may indeed be eligible, and you get 35% of that. That really stretches your runway, and it gets better because your bank, it, once it's been approved, and, um, and uh, you know it's coming, the government can take several months, many months, to get you that check. But I believe that that becomes an asset. That you can yeah, go it's on. it's uh, what happens, and now this is something that you have to discuss with your CA. Uh, but the receivable from the government actually is shown as an asset on your balance sheet. The uh, banks look at your assets as a form of collateral for. Uh, offering you lines of credit. It's usually lines of credit as opposed to term loans. There's a difference. So that if you have a record of continuous payments from CRA on your shred credits, the bank will look at that and say, yeah, OK, these guys are good. We'll give you a certain percentage of a line of credit against those shred credits. We're not going to give you 100% against it. Uh, we could give you up to 75% against it. Uh, again, it all depends on the individual company. Um, it, is, it, it really depends, however, on your history with the government. Uh, like Tony was saying, there's some people who claim uh, against CRA for certain shred credits, and they may be a little over aggressive with their CAs and actually put it on as a bona fide, they think it's a bona fide asset. And at the end of the day, uh, the government rejects their claim. Uh, you can get into a lot of trouble by being overly aggressive that way. So um, if you've got a history, and if it is uh, a good history, obviously, uh, yes, we'll consider it. As bankers, we'll consider it as part of a marginable uh, collateral. Yeah, I can't emphasize enough how important this can be to a high-tech startup. You get a million dollars invested in you and it lasts you a year. You basically got a free four-month ride by just cycling this money back around. And uh, it's not that hard to do. You know, yes, you have to follow the rules and understand that or have a you know, have someone who is working for you who does, and there's lots of people who act as advisors on these. But, uh, you know, talk about stretching your money. Um, you're really crazy not to take full advantage of it. Enough said there. So, now we got the CRA, and that's because of your shreds. We put that on separately. Um, now, uh, relationships. I will turn social entrepreneurs to talk about <laughs> relationships. So this is probably my favorite slide of the evening. I think the other ones are extraordinarily, everything's really important here, but now it's up to you. So we've given you the how to deal with lawyers, how to deal with accountants, what to look for in the government. But now you've got to start actually building the relationships and going out there and, and pursuing these relationships. And so I often, and I've, I've given some of the lectures about this, I, I use the word networking, which I'm assuming we're all very familiar with. But oftentimes people recoil. They're like, oh my God, I don't want to network. I don't like to network, it's very slimy. And so we go through this process where I actually like to turn the word around and say, when you're networking, it's, it's less about you and it's more about the person that you're trying to interact with. And so you're creating this genuine relationship where you're asking for information. So you do a lot more listening than you do speaking. So I've had other, I've worked at, um, I've been a member of some panels where I've had individuals come up to you with great business ideas, and they, I think they want to get to know some of my expertise, but they spend the first 20 minutes spewing out all about themselves and who they are and what they can do, and it's really fantastic. Um, and it's great, but we don't get the kind of value there is from that common dialogue that we both get to share by having a genuine relationship aspect to the introduction or to the meeting itself. Um, so I've actually, again, 
I'm always referring back to the links. If you go on the, the, uh, the presentation, there's a great blog that I came across recently called The Key to Powerful Relationships. It's all about genuine networking. And it gives you seven key steps, which are really easy, but things that you should remember as you're continuing to build your ecosystem or your networks with the individuals that we've mentioned uh, throughout this presentation. So, for example, let's talk about professional organizations and trade associations. You know as well as I know that there are a whole lot of organizations, there are a whole lot of conferences that you could go to all across Canada, all across the U.S., all across the world. But in fact, it's up to you to start being strategic. Why do you need to go? Who do you want to meet? Um, should you go? How much does it cost? But in terms of building relationships, you really have to ask yourself, who are the key panelists? Who's speaking? What's their backgrounds? What relevance do they have to what you're trying to do? And how, in fact, can you learn from this individual? And how could you start, potentially, a genuine relationship with these individuals? Um, again, you know, for the, the techies out there, the science, there's lots of scientific conferences. It's the same thing. It's always the same model, regardless of, again, what you're trying to do, whether it's a nonprofit side or it's a for-profit side. Um, and then finally, the partners, so your government officials. Again, if you are a nonprofit and you're trying to raise money um, or talk to individuals from different ministries, you in fact need to get out there and to find out who's running the organization or who's running the ministry, what kind of funding they have, who are the key people, and how do you make sure that you know and you learn more about this person and that you continue to build this relationship so that you can call them and ask them and, and kind of troubleshoot when you have different questions or and or you need um, specific ideas. Um, and in terms of the bank, well, we have our chief resident this evening who can talk about that. The, uh, one of the things that I've seen in my career is that uh, you might have an individual that is brilliant at doing what they do. In other words, if, if they are in IT and, and they've, they've been able to create some kind of software or hardware, um, that is really could, could turn the world around. But they have no capability of being able to sell that idea, i.e. sell themselves, really. Um, then that is a drawback to that person. Um, it is one thing to be an excellent scientist, an excellent technologist, but if you're going to run your own business, you must also learn to become a good salesman, salesperson. And for some people, that's a very tough gap to cross. But you will need to cross that gap. I mean, some people just get a sales force. They don't want to be out there in front of the public. Well, you know what? When you're just starting off, you can't afford a sales force. You can't afford salespeople unless they're strictly on commission and they'll take a percentage of the take. But you, as the entrepreneur, need to sell yourself. It means getting away from the lab, getting away from the computer, getting away from your desk, and actually networking, meeting new people, going out into the world, making your face known, and getting other people to give you some ideas on where is the next opportunity for you. I see it in banking as well. Uh, uh, in, in, there's two kinds of bankers that, that I've dealt with over the years. They're the, the analysts, the people who can really break apart financial statements calculate the ratios. They've got spreadsheets coming out your yin-yang. They could tell you everything about a company in 15 minutes. Put them in front of clients. They're like a deer in headlights. They don't know how to speak to people. They don't know how to deal with them diplomatically. They don't know what questions to ask them in, in the right way. As an entrepreneur, you will need to develop those skills. It's not something you go to school for, really. I don't know. Do you guys teach any skills like that? Uh, but it is something that you need to develop. Selling yourself is a matter of listening, talking, and sorry, um, and being able to influence others. Yeah, and I, you know, I think um, from my perspective, um, get to know your 
account manager at the bank early? Yeah, that, yeah okay. So, uh, th that's another thing, too. Um, it, it, in fact, we were talking about this in the boardroom just before uh, we met here. If you um, think that uh, you don't need to talk to your banker today, just open up a bank account, and uh, that's enough. Uh, you may be in for a surprise in six months down the road when the cash flow is getting a little, a little weak and you don't, you don't have any money in the bank, but you know, like you've got tons of receivables and, and the business model is very strong, it's very good. But the time to visit your banker and really to getting to know your banker is not when you've got a payroll check that's due at three o'clock on Friday and say, I need help. Your banker is not going to be able to help you. Bankers hate surprises, okay? So you don't want to surprise your banker. You want to be able to develop, you want to engender a relationship with your banker before you need your banker. And uh, so get to know your banker before you're going to need that loan, that line of credit. And um, it'll make things a lot easier and smoother. And it, it's, I mean, we've, we've often talked about this in, in our office. Uh, the best time to ask for a loan from your banker is when you don't need it. Mm -hmm. um, I know that doesn't sound right, does it? Uh, no. But uh, no. get a line of credit, get, a, get established. And if you don't use that line of credit for the first year, well, so what? It's an insurance policy. They've given you that line of credit, so when the cash flow does get tight, you can write a check and you know it's not going to bounce. Uh, so it, it is uh, important that, like your lawyers, your accountants, your bankers are also advisors and partners in your success going forward in the business. So get to know them. I think Dan has described um Many of the things not to do, which I personally did in my first oh, company. Oh no, you 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 did no. <laughs> and and you know, I would I didn't understand what my account manager needed, what she had to report on, and I went sailing in there when I needed to have payroll covered, and said, oh trust me, trust me. There's I've got a receivable. We've been doing this contract. I got a big check coming, but. I need you to cover these, these payroll checks. She had no idea what our business was about, and this was in the bad old days. I don't think she was actually that interested. But she knew that I was going to be offside, I was going to be in the hole, and I guess there are little red flags that pop up, and she has to go to meetings and explain why that has happened and when that is going to be corrected, as in, like, today. Um, uh, you know, what I know now, I mean, go meet them, buy them a coffee, and explain your passion. Get them excited about what you're doing. Don't overdo it. Um, you know, don't, when their eyes start to glaze over, you've gone too far. But get them, <laughs> get them excited yeah, about your happens, business yeah. and understand your plans and growth. Again, no surprises. Yeah. When you come back in and say, hey, you know, we said we were going to get there. We're there. We did it. We got that customer. That's all, you know, check mark, said they do it, did it. You're building confidence. Um, again, and it's just relationships. And, and uh, you know, we put, there's a special box here. I, I couldn't put CIBC in the, in the red box. <laughs> Why not? It says, it says <laughs> bank. You, Quick, let's you, white uh, it out right now and let's just put in CIBC. <laughs> uh, but they are a, they are a key partner. Um, on your business and you can see your ecosystem is really getting pretty big now with all the trade associations so I think we have about one uh, slide left here because I know we are getting on for for time and so you want to tell them what not to do yeah so the first thing not to do and some entrepreneurs will fall into this trap is now that I've got my business plan I've got some potential early funding I'm gonna go out and like pimp out my office so it looks great. I go into the office every day and I'm like, I'm the CEO, look at me. 
Wrong idea, guys, wrong idea. Only because your cash flow right now isn't necessarily stable, meaning that you might be able to actually have this Ikea slash furniture or something else you wanna buy, but you might not. So wait until, in fact, you have a company that has revenues on a regular basis, and then you may be able to actually develop a little bit more of a fancy office for yourself. But don't do it right out of the gate. I know it's tempting. Um, and don't hire your relatives necessarily. They're great, and you love your relatives, whomever they may be. I'm sure they have like great skills, and they can do marvelous things. They can complement your own skills, what you don't have. But in fact, you bring a lot of other baggage into that kind of relationship. So there, let's say you're midnight, you're closing a deal, you're trying to get this last sales call done, and your business partner who happens to be like your sister or brother, my, son, my sister, she comes in and she's like, I didn't make that call today. So I have two choices at this point. I can either act like she's my business partner and kind of freak out, or I can remember that she's my sister and I have to, she's my sister. I don't want to get into those kind of situations. I want it to be all business all the time. So be really, really careful who you bring in to your partnership team. Um, and in terms of scientists, you know, you guys are really, really smart people and it's fantastic. But remember, you want to bring in complementary skills. So it's not great that the two of you have the same idea around your new technology and you both developed in the lab together because you now need someone that can actually go out and sell the idea or can build the network, can build the relationships. And if the two of you are working together, you may have actually not have that kind of skill, which in fact will impede you, rather enhance your ability to grow your business. Um, so remember, the bottom line is make sure you know your own skills, you know your own self, and then bring in people that can actually complement those skills, and that way you know that you're gonna move your, uh, your business forward. We once had at the uh, fund I was associated with a, a theoretical physicist, an academic, uh, came in to start up the company, and his hiring plan, the first 10 hires, were going to be theoretical physicists. Um, and we sort of said, Sounds good in theory. Yeah, well, uh, um, it, we're obviously going on too long here. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, we said, don't you need some, you know, administrative assistance at least, or, you know, maybe somebody who can get out and do business development? No. Uh, this individual wanted to hire physicists, so. Uh, needless to say, we uh, passed on that opportunity. That's the end of the formal lecture. As usual, happy to answer any questions. I do apologize, we've gone a little long today. Um, answer formal questions or chat with people um, who want to come up at the end. Uh, question. Yeah. At what stage um, should you incorporate when you're building your, eco your business ecosystem? Because you're making the, so you might not necessarily have money coming in, but is it really important to incorporate when you're just trying to build those relationships so that you're serious? I guess, well, oh, sorry, Dan, okay, you go ahead. It's, um, it's a question of liability in certain instances. If you're going to be uh, in a business where it's easy to get sued or there are potential uh, hazards in, in that regard, if you incorporate, you're limiting your liability. If you are a sole proprietor uh, and something happens in the course of business where you're going to get sued, you will be sued personally as well. So if you incorporate, you're protecting yourself. Uh, incorporation also allows you to split income. If you are a sole proprietor or in a partnership, you'll be taxed at the full personal tax rate on any revenues you generate. With a corporation, you can uh, shelter some of the income in, within the company and be taxed at a much lower rate. Um, at the outset, a lot of people think, oh, it's an expense that I, I, I don't want to go through right now. Me personally, and, and you, you may get a difference of opinion from, from talking to other CAs and lawyers and so on. Me personally, I would say incorporate right from the get-go. Yeah. I, I would say that the, to me the single deciding factor, if you are starting to sign agreements, non-disclosure agreements, um, uh, you know, sampling agreements, the moment you're signing something, I would advise you should be doing it as a corporation. You sign an NDA, even if you're just trying to suss out the market, you sign an NDA and it's a joint one, 
you personally are responsible if they feel you have disclosed and it's your house and everything that's on the line. So the moment, if you're just talking to folks, trying to determine is there a market, is there any interest, you don't, uh, you don't have to do that, but you don't get too far down that road before someone says, we better get an NDA in place. And if you've got their appetite whetted, you don't want to say, well, time out while I get incorporated. No, so that argues it's not that expensive. If it doesn't go anywhere, there's all sorts of people that have a numbered company, 2468 Ontario Inc., and you can trot it out with your next idea. Uh, it's just handy to have, so earlier rather than later. And really quick, I just think it sends the right signal. That's what you're looking for. You want the market yes. to know that you're serious, you're ready to go, you've got your idea, and you're incorporated already as a business. So whether you're talking, like Tony was mentioning, you're talking to some people, investors, bankers, as you build your, your ecosystem, incorporated, you have your cards, you're set to go, people are, are really eager then to engage a different level as if you had just come and said, I've got this interesting idea. Okay, thank you. Uh, you're getting into a bit of a gray area there. Uh, Not-for-profit organizations, corporations, uh, need to have a charter that is uh, either provincially or federally uh, registered. And it, within that charter, uh, and, and this would be in the Articles of the Incorporation, it would indicate if this company is going to be uh, there to make money or not. Um, I suppose there are people in the past who've registered not-for-profit companies, but they really are really more for profit. And so you, you get into a little bit of difficulty with CRA down the road. If, if you're trying to evade taxes, um, I look at non-for-profits as charities. If you're, and now, a charity is not meaning that you are going to work for nothing, uh, but it means that there is something beyond just the profit motive if, you're, if you've got a, a, a charity going. So at, at the end of the day, if you are an, an entrepreneur who is really trying to make a go of it in a business that otherwise you could be an employee somewhere else doing the same thing, then I would say it is a for-profit company. And however, at the end of the day, there's some gray areas. So you could seek out the advice, you should seek out the advice of a lawyer and or CA. And or SIG, so I have a different little yes. bit different take yeah. on that. And I think you asked a really great question because I deal with a lot of entrepreneurs who come in and, and they're like, w "What am I? Who do I? You know, where do I exist?" And having worked, you know, in the sector, um, I recently got some really interesting advice, which was focus less on what should my legal structure be and focus more on like what's what's the ultimate marketplace look like. What's my vision for this company? And as that continues to evolve, it will become much more natural for you to say, I should be a nonprofit or I should be a for profit. You know, you specifically mentioned that you have manufacturing and it sounds like almost a clean tech focus. So without any more you know, information, just with that, I would probably send you more towards the, the for profit side of things. But we'd have to have you know, a more, like you said, it was, it's a bit of a gray. Um, but you have to ask yourself at the end of the day also, where do I want to get my money? How do I want to sustain myself? What does the marketplace look like? And that should hopefully lead you down into deciding you know, either or, and or hopefully at one point more of a hybrid structure here in Canada. And again, one thing to remember, um, the tax department is very powerful. Uh, there is a general rule. Any transaction or structure 
that they deem was created solely for the purpose of avoiding taxes, they just treat that as if it had never been done. So companies get involved where they, you know, they sell to a subsidiary and they do it at prices that, um, you know, shield tax, uh, try to get the taxes offshore. Revenue Canada will look at that and say, that's not a bona fide transaction. That was done solely for the purpose of avoiding taxes. Reducing is fine. Minimizing is fine. Avoiding, they'll just say, it's as if that didn't happen. We will tax you as if that had not happened. And um, we want that money now. So they, that is an overarching rule. No matter what you do and how you structure things, they have the power to say, doesn't matter. I don't agree with that. That was done to avoid taxes. You owe us now. And so this is why, if it is gray, get professional advice, because I know any number of people who have inadvertently fallen foul. And this is where people get clever with structures that you know switch stuff around. Um, Aaron in Canada is not dumb. Uh, they just look at that and say, uh-uh. And, and they, Revenue Canada can be very one-sided, and because they have so much power, they can run roughshod over you. And unless mm -hmm. you've got a very deep pockets to get uh, accountants and lawyers to fight on your behalf, they normally win in these situations. So, you know, get the right advice right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. Sorry, question here. First of all, thank you very much for your very excellent informative uh, lectures. The second thing is that I apologize for my English because it is my second language. And my question is that you mentioned something about building up the history of a new setup uh, corporation uh, in, uh, that is very important for uh, banking accommodation for that corporation. Uh, my question is that if we are, uh, uh, we are setting up a new company in Canada, and, uh, but we don't have any history here, but we have a very good history in the United States, and that history uh, uh, can have some, for example, patents, some uh, successful uh, scientific uh, background and these things. Does the parents' history in the United States will help the new startup company in Canada? Yes. Thank you very much. Now oh, that, do you want me to elaborate on that? <laughs> <laughs> but would that, I mean, is it truly a, a sub of a U.S. parent, or is it a new Canadian company that has in-licensed Canadian rights? Because to me, I think that would make a difference. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm, I made an assumption there that uh, there is a, a, a very strong relationship, a non-arms length relationship with the U.S. company so that uh, it, there are probably financial statements that we can rely on from the U.S. parent. Uh, quite often in, in situations like that, we will seek the guarantee of the U.S. parent. We may also register some security in whatever state that uh, that, that company is registered in that uh, protects us in the event that the Canadian satellite or the, the Canadian branch uh, cannot meet its obligations to the bank going forward. So, uh, yes, if it is just a new company that really the, the, the principles may be somehow related, but really the new company in Canada is not going to be doing or relying on, on the parent, it, it's you're talking about a whole new venture now, and then we have to treat it as a brand new company. Having said that, though, if, if we're, we've got principles behind a company that have a lot of experience, a lot of success, we will take a look at that company and uh, see what we can do for them. I, but a word of caution, something that is brand new and untested, the bankers are leery to lend to that kind of an entity. Unless you have strong background security, whether it be by way of GICs, stocks, bonds, uh, collateral mortgages over homes, it would be difficult to get financing for a brand new startup where someone 
has no experience running that kind of a company. You may be a tremendous scientist, you may be a brilliant mind, but if you don't have the business expertise, uh, you're going to have a hard time talking to your banker into saying, we'd like to borrow some money from you. That's where the friends, family, and fools comes in. <laughs> family and fools. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay. Venture capitalists, however, will do that. And there are venture capitalists in this building. Mm -hmm. And IT companies have used venture capitalists a lot in the past. Uh, another avenue is the Business Development Bank of Canada. They have, uh, we were talking about shred credits earlier. Um, the Business Development Bank has consultants who will advise on those types of things, but they also deal with venture capitalist corporations that uh, you may be able to get some funding from in, in that uh, area. Okay, if there are no more questions, thank you. And if anyone wants to come up. Thank you.